to figure out which way is up. Um, but we'll try to do it better next time. So this is me. Uh, so I spent about 15 years as a software consultant. Um, and I realized kind of every time I teach this class or teach other stuff, that I actually did a lot of data science. We just didn't call it that then. Uh, we just called it getting work done. Um, and now we have this fancy new term data science uh, that we're going to talk about in this class and like what that means and why we have introduced it and why it's kind of fundamentally different from software engineering as well as from statistics. Can you all hear me in the back? All right, I'm usually pretty loud, but I'll use a mic if, if necessary. Uh, most of my other classrooms have been wide instead of deep. Um, and then I spent about eight years at Red Hat. Anybody know who the company Red Hat is? Wow, all right, using, using zero. It is owned by IBM now. We're not proud of that fact, but anybody else? Anybody, anybody else about Red Hat? Have you used that? There's this thing, it's called the intranet. Anybody use that before? All right, so most of that actually runs on an operating system. So an operating system is like you probably run Windows or Mac, okay? There's another very prominent operating system called Linux. Except it's not very often run on people's like laptops. So most people don't have a lot of experience with it. But most of the internet, so all those servers, most of those run Linux. And if you want to buy Linux from someone, often you buy it from a company called Red Hat, who will basically give you service and support for it. But the weird thing about Linux, unlike Microsoft, you know, Windows, and you know, Apple's Macintosh, is that it is open source. So you can actually just download and install it for free. But what Red Hat offers is service and support so that if you're a company and you have a problem, you have somebody you can call, or we used to refer to as ring the neck of, right? When something goes poorly. So that's what Red Hat does. Uh, they, before they were acquired by IBM, they were approximately a $12 billion company that very few people have ever heard. Um, they also make a lot of other software, but they're mostly running for links. Um, I also spent three years as I uh, struck, uh, what do we call it? Uh, we now call it an expert in residence. So Spark is if you, most of you are probably in, you know, early in your college career, but as you get later in your college career or later in science or later in computer, you know, software or computer engineering or that kind of stuff, we offer a bunch of what we call experiential learning classes and internships and things like that so that you can actually work on a project for a third party. So it's not a manufacturer thing. So all the stuff you do in this class, while we use real world data, we manufacture the problem, right? So we base it on real world data, but we know what the outcome is, okay? If you're doing all these projects for a third party, we don't know what the outcome is, right? That's kind of the idea. So it tends to be local government and nonprofits, um, and we have these class structures so you can do that. So as an expert in residence, while I still worked at Red Hat, I would actually teach a couple of classes, but I also was kind of there and available if you wanted like career advice about how to get into software engineering, et cetera. So I did that for a bunch of years. Um, and then eventually they said, hey, why don't you come and actually become a professor at BU? And I said, well, yeah, what else do I have to do? Um, so, that, so now I'm a faculty member in CDS and I teach this class in the data science like major. Um, and then I also teach with uh, the Spark program, I usually teach one of what we call practicum classes. So those projects for external parties, we call them practicums. Um, and this semester, I'm going to be doing data science for good. And that is focused this semester. It's an FCC uh, cross college challenge uh, class. And it is focused on kind of data science and criminal justice. So the projects all involve data science and criminal justice. And I'm co-teaching it with a public defender. Does that make sense? You all know what XCC is? All right, so if you haven't looked at Cross College Challenge, there's a lot of really interesting classes there. They come with four hub units. And if you're in kind of a tech adjacent major, one of them is usually writing intensive, which is very hard to get otherwise, as you probably experienced. Um, so they can be a lot of fun. So it's a writing intensive course, but it's in a field that might be more interesting to you than say your typical English class. So that's the idea. Uh, these are my kids. Uh, my one running joke is this is the only way I can get them in the same picture um, is by using two. Uh, but my, old, my oldest is the one on the right, and then uh, my youngest is the one in the middle, and then my middle daughter. Uh, and then 
My big project that I did at Red Hat was this thing called modularity, which was uh, jokingly referred to as destroying the Linux distribution and then putting it back, back together again. And then the other photo I like for you was my Rasputin photo, because it looks like I was Rasputin. But that's the first time I gave a talk at a math conference, uh, which was many, many years ago. And we don't have to go into when. Um, and then I want to introduce Rohan, who is the teaching assistant for this class. Rohan, you want to stand up? He's sitting in the very, very back so he can hide from you all uh, and monitor, I don't know, whatever you're doing or not, something. Uh, so a little bit about Rohan is here. Um, and so he'll be leading the discussion sections. Please keep in mind there is a discussion section tomorrow. Okay, we use it as a setup period for basically the quote unquote lab work that we do across this course. Um, it should, like in a magic world, it would go perfectly every time. It rarely does. So we use that section to make sure that it, you know, gets set up correctly and you don't have a huge pain in the butt later. All right, any questions so far? Cool. All right, so getting into a little bit of mechanics. Um, we use Piazza for communication in this class. This has already happened. Plus, we haven't even had class yet, okay? I've already gotten two emails that I will likely ignore, okay? I'm very bad with email. So if you want to get a response on something, I'm not gonna make it to class. I need to make up something or another. I can't make the final exam, et cetera. Use Piazza. You can make a private post. Then all of kind of the instruction team will be able to respond to it. Um, and that way you will actually get a response, whereas it will just, versus just getting buried in my email. Um, you can write to us directly. Uh, my email address, I think, is in the service. Um, and, you know, if it's something private or something you don't want to communicate with anybody else, you can also come to office hours and talk to me about whatever. You can also schedule office hours, which again is in the syllabus or on Piazza. So if you go to Piazza, um, has anybody used Piazza before? Actually, I'll show you in a second. So don't worry about it. All right. Same with Rohan. Um, and then the other thing I want to introduce you, uh, not all of them are quite in place yet, but we'll also have four what we call course assistants in this class. So these are students who have already taken this class, but are undergraduates. So, you know, usually um, if they usually took it like last semester, maybe the semester before. Uh, so they will be available in the discussion sections and they will also have office hours. So they might be the best person to go to when you have a question because they are going to have the most kind of like they just learned it right so they're probably going to be good at explaining it to you if you're not getting something um failing that you can also talk to the ta or you can talk to me and we all have office hours as you see um all of the office hours will be in that fancy new building i don't know if any of you've seen it yet um, but it's kind of like big jack going up Sometimes referred to as the agenda building. It's actually designed to look like a set of books. And on a, like a nice day, you can kind of see the pages there. If you look at it, it's kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, everybody in the right place? All right. BU is uh, a university that just has classes like in a big, long, like mile. Okay. I fully expect some or all of you have classes right before this one. So you may be late. If you are late, okay, please either use that back door or going forward, these first two sections, kind of four seats over, first two rows, please leave those open unless you're late. So that anybody coming in on this door can sit right there without causing too much of a disruption. All right. Questions? All right. All right. So getting into a little bit about what is data science. Um, so this is the definition we're using. Um, one of the things you'll learn about the software world is that uh, we change terminology a lot. Okay, anybody have a good positive guess? How long has medicine been around? Just a guess. Two years. Fifty years. What do you got? Medicine as a practice, as an art. 2,000 years. Yeah, 2,000 years is probably about right. Think about the Hippocratic Oath, right? It was about 2,000 years ago, probably actually probably more than that, 1,500 or uh, 2,500 years ago, maybe even. Um, so medicine's been around for a while. As a result, there's a lot of specialties, there's a lot of striation within it. People have a pretty good idea what an oncologist does, right? Um, in our field, in the software industry, how long has the software industry been around? Any guesses? And again, ballpark. 50 years. 
50 years, I would say I'm getting old now, so it's actually probably more like 100 now, you know, 1950s or so, you know, maybe 1930s, you know, arguable, uh, depending on kind of when you start counting. But as you might imagine, as a result, we change the names of things a lot, okay? And we add kind of new fields and new specialties. We uh, redefine terminology on the radio. Uh, so that if you've ever found software kind of jargon confusing, Part of it is, is because a bunch of uh, software people also tend to be wordies, and so like to reuse words in fun and interesting ways uh, to uh, like get a point across. So that's the first problem. But then the second problem is the terms change a lot. Okay, so it is very common for something like data science, which literally didn't exist as a term ten years ago, to be like the thing. Now. Okay, so. Keep that in mind when you're looking at this terminology. This is a definition we're going to use for this class, and I would say it's probably a good definition for you know your career here and probably the first part of your career after that. But it may get refined over time. But preparing and understanding data using mathematics and software. So why is this distinction important? Any ideas? There's a hint on the right. Guesses? Data is exploding. Okay. The amount of data that we're producing is ridiculous. As a result, even though we've had a mathematics component called statistics for a long time, doing statistics on these sets of data by hand is impossible. Okay. Like almost literally impossible. If you spent your entire life, you probably couldn't do the math on an exabyte of data. Okay, like it's just huge. Okay, and I think people don't really get a good scale of this, so that's why I use this example. So the first term, okay, that you'll see is bit. Okay, so a bit is the smallest unit that a computer can address. Okay, and that's a zero or a one. Okay, or on off or true or false. And you may have heard this referred to as binary. Okay, so it counts in binary. So zero one. And then, you know, basically you count with just zeros and ones instead of using like zero through nine, like we use in the decimal system. So computers are stupid. And this is something that I will repeat regularly throughout this class. Computers are very, very dumb. They just act smart. But they are very stupid. You are much, much smarter. And as a result, you have to tell them exactly what to do in very simple terms. And that's why people find things like programming quite difficult because you gloss over a lot of the steps a lot of the time. And so what you have to think about when you're telling a computer, imagine, you know, somebody like, at least I use as an example, my younger siblings, okay? That you just have to explain every little step because who knows why, but apparently they're not real smart, okay? So think about your brother or sister and when you've had to get them to do like empty the dishwasher at home, the steps you have to give them are very, very small. A computer is even dumber. Okay, so you have to get really, really small. But in in kind of fundamentally, all it can think in is ones and or zeros and ones. Okay, and if you ever notice on a power switch on a computer, it often is like a almost like a almost a circle and then like a bar through it like that. The reason is is because it's a zero and a one. Okay, so it's on and off. Right. Uh, so just kind of a it's, you've probably seen it a million times and never really thought about what that picture meant. All right, so then the next thing up we have is what's called a byte, okay? And byte is intentionally, and this is where I get into a bunch of nerd wordies playing with words. Byte is like a byte, okay? Except it's spelled with a Y because it wants to be fancy. And it's one character, okay? So say so I know what a character is, and why do I say character versus like letter? You know what a character is? Okay, so, so that's a very detailed answer, um, but we'll talk about the simpler version. That is, you are not incorrect, but I'm going to go with a simpler version. So this is not really like weird uncle that is referred to as a character. This is literally like any number, any letter, okay, or any uh, punctuation mark, okay? All of those, the reason, but we call those things differently, right? We call them letters and numbers and punctuation marks. So as a grouping, it's a character. 
Okay. Many of you are actually probably more familiar with a lot of this terminology than certainly I was when I was college because it's in common practice now. But that's what we mean by character. And what you were mentioning in the back was that it's actually a standard, okay, called ASCII. Okay, which is actually an acronym, the American Standard for Character, something or another, I can't remember. But it's actually an acronym um, that actually defines how many bits and bytes go into each character so that you know exactly what it is. So, for example, the letter A, capital, I think, off the top of my head, is, is actually a 32 decimal. Okay, I don't remember what the binary is, but it's it's defined as the number 32. So if you think about counting in binary, 32 binary bits would get it. Okay. So then the next up is like a kilobyte. Okay, again, both all three of these you've probably never seen before because they're so small now that you almost never use them anymore. Okay, so a kilobyte is about a 200 word essay. Okay. Do you imagine writing a 200 word essay? That seems like work, right? It's like, you know, material for an essay. It's not a big essay, but it's certainly like effort. But imagine one kilobyte, okay, is a 200 word essay, okay? And the reason it's called a kilobyte is because it is 8,000 bytes, okay? Now, here's where it gets a little confusing, and most of this is not going to get tested too much, but a kilo, when we talk about it in computer land, okay, is not actually a thousand, it's a power of two. So it's 1,024, okay? But we call it a kilo because it's right around 1,000 and it's close enough that the language works. So we have a kilobyte, then we have a megabyte, which is one minute of music. So if you think about music, it's actually got a lot more density than words do as far as like how much it has to store in the computer. So one megabyte is 1,000 kilobytes, okay? And we're just going up by thousands each time. Um, and then a gigabyte is 230 songs. So this is the realm where you're probably starting to recognize the terminology, right? You probably have computers that use, that have some number of gigabytes as like storage or some number of gigabytes that have as RAM, okay? Um, I still remember spending $500 on my first gigabyte hard drive, just to give you some sense of scale. Terabyte, okay? So anybody seen the TV show Avatar? Come on, somebody has to have seen Avatar. All right. Um, so the entire series, okay, is one terabyte of video. All right. So the entire thing, only one terabyte. Then we talk about petabytes. That's three and a half years of video. Some people argue that the human brain is about two and a half petabytes. Okay. An exabyte is all the words ever spoken by mankind. Okay, it is whatever about five exabytes. So, so not just like at any given moment, ever. Okay, ever, ever is five exabytes. And then a zettabyte is basically, if you think about what this would, I, I can't even come up with like an example, right? So, but if you think about one brick being a gigabyte, it's 258 great walls of China. Okay, it's pretty decent size, right? So, when we talk about this stuff, this data is ridiculously large, okay? When we're doing data science kind of in the field, it is not uncommon to be working with a petabyte of data. Okay. It is rare to be working like the smallest you'll usually get to is a terabyte. Okay. So, as you can imagine, doing that by hand is ridiculous. So, as a result, we use computers and we use various mechanisms to both simplify the problem. So, how do we turn that petabyte of data into something that's actionable by reducing the data set somehow? Okay or by using faster and faster computers to try to be able to process it. All right, Let's see if there was anything else. Yeah, and just, uh, I do like to know, these are approximations, you know. So just to give you a sense of scale, this is as of like, whatever, a couple of years ago now, um, but the growth of data in annual internet traffic is 2.3 zettabytes a year. Okay, so that's just traffic, right? And these days, has anybody ever seen that experience where you go looking for a pair of shoes and then it advertises you that pair of shoes like on every website afterwards? Okay, the reason that is, is because every interaction with a website is now tracked, okay? Sometimes with an outcome, okay? So the outcome is they wanna advertise that set of shoes to you kind of across the internet. 
But because there's, it's so easy to collect the data now that now most companies just store anything they can get with the expectation that they may use it later. Okay. So as a result, there are many companies that have probably stored 2.3 zettabytes of data, individual copies. Okay. Maybe not all of it, but a good chunk. So as you can imagine, the data is just exploding. So my my favorite picture in the slide deck. Uh, so you think we need some science, right? Um, so and the science part here. This is where uh, how many of you here are data science majors? Okay. So as a data science major, uh, hopefully somebody talked to you about uh, there being kind of two different tracks, right? There's kind of the mechanics of execution or practical usage of data science. And then there's also kind of the algorithmic side or the mathematical side uh, or research side of data science. And that's what this is, okay, is that we can't always just buy a faster computer, okay? Sometimes the computers just can't be fast enough. So as a result, we got to come up with new and smarter ways to reduce the data set maybe into something that is more manageable or find tricks to operate on that data set such that we can actually do something with it without just buying bigger and bigger computers. Does that make sense? So that's why there's kind of two big tracks is that there's a lot of stuff we can operate on right now, and there's a lot of stuff we don't know how to do. And we got to figure that out as a kind of community. All right, so this class is meant to be an introduction to the field in general, okay? It's also meant to be um, what I, I love this term. My, uh, my youngest son made it up for our family. I presume somebody else has also made it up. Uh, that refers to it as bull shrimp. Um, so how do you identify a bull shrimp? Okay, there's a famous quote, lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? Um, the reason is, is because it's really easy to take a set of statistics and misrepresent what's there, especially if you know math and the people you're communicating with don't know that math. So as a result, one of the things that's important in this class and throughout the major, okay, all of our data science classes, is the ethics of what we're doing. So not only that you know how to manipulate this data, but then how to present it in an ethical way, such that you're communicating what you think you're communicating or what you should be communicating, okay? So there's always malicious actors. We're gonna presume for the sake of argument that everyone in here is not malicious, uh, so you can always cheat, but it is also very easy to make a mistake and misrepresent data. So that's what we're trying to avoid. So we don't need to do that as um, and we want to have some fun with the data. So next slide is, what should you already know when you walk into this box? Okay. Um, and there's a pretty easy answer to this, which is you don't need to be able to code. You don't need high-level math. You don't need statistics. But some level of identifying bull trend would be useful. Okay. Uh, hopefully most of you have. Um, I particularly like one of these, my... Kids have learned uh, in school that they call the crap test. Has anyone heard the crap test? Can you learn this? It's a way of identifying, it's an acronym, by the way of identifying whether or not a website is reputable, um, which I think is hilarious um, because I, I apparently have a mind of 12 year old. Um, but long story short, we're going to teach other code. Uh, we're not going to use particularly high level math. All the math we do, if you took some level of algebra class in high school or you know, kind of secondary school, you probably have already covered this. It should just be a refresher. We may tweak it a bit in how we use it and why, but largely the math is not particularly difficult. If it was, I wouldn't be teaching this course because as I said, I come from a software engineering background, uh, which means that the extent of my math after college was I needed to be able to like add one of the things and I still can't do that. I still have off by one errors all the time. Okay, can't count. So, long story short, we're not going to be doing a lot of math. Uh, when we do use it, we'll give it a formula, we'll tell you how to use it, and we'll be able to look it up. Um, and most of it will be covered by software dealing it with it for you. Okay, so you might, when we teach the fundamentals, it's important to kind of have a grounding. And why I really appreciate the math I took in college, um, because it gives me a grounding in kind of what I'm doing. But I don't use it every day, but I know roughly what I'm trying to accomplish that way. So then I can go and look up the right answers. Okay. One of the things that you learn, especially in software engineering at large, um, is that 
uh, it is significantly more important to learn how to learn than it is to learn things. Does that make sense? Because it changes all the time, right? As I said before, so you keep having to learn new stuff. Um, and so knowing how to do that effectively is very, very useful. All right. So that was our little brief introduction to data science. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the syllabus um, and kind of expectations for the class. So the first and foremost um, I'd like to mention is that the syllabus is a contract. And it is a contract with you students and me, the professor, about what we're going to do. Okay, And this is true for every class. Some professors will uh, be more contractually bound than others. But in general, the idea of the syllabus is that it's a contract. So what should you always do if you ever receive a contract before you sign it? So read it, okay? So read the syllabus. However, there are, there are some things in the syllabus that are in there because I am required to put them in there to make the hub happen, for example. Uh, you can gloss over those, certainly. Okay, what you want to look at is the stuff that's related to the class. I actually think the whole concept of the hub is actually really interesting and a really interesting, useful way to do a core uh, that is fundamentally different than like the one that was at my school when I went to college. Um, so it is interesting, at least to me. So if it's interesting, you feel free to read it, but you don't really need it. So read the course description. Make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into. Okay. Um, and then books and other course materials. I can tell you it's pretty easy. We basically rely on one book. It is open source and published on the internet. Um, it makes it a little difficult that I have yet to find a good copy or a current copy of um, the whole book as like a PDF to read on like an e-reader. Uh, so that's a little annoying, but you can always read it in a browser. And it doesn't cost money. So who cares? Uh, course fair. So we're going to talk about that more in a minute. Um, and assignments and grading. So this is very important, okay? The way the grades are structured is broken down by percentages. So homeworks are worth a certain amount in total, labs are worth a certain amount in total, uh, exams, et cetera. So you should look at how that breakdown works so that you know where to concentrate your efforts. And then how to succeed in this course, we do try very hard. Like what I want is everybody in this class to get an A. Okay, this is not what we refer to as like a weed out course. Okay, the idea is I want you to have enough grounding that you can kind of move into data science if you want to, or at least have a good understanding of it and go off and do whatever for you. Okay, so criminal justice, for good. Um, and then the tentative schedule. So the reason I say the tentative schedule, things get a little fuzzy sometimes. Okay, so for example, maybe we don't get as far as one of the lectures that I met to you or whatever. So I may need to write up a for example, stuff like that. So I will always, if I make a change to this contract, to the schedule, um, I will always announce it on Piazza and I will always post a new one. And it usually will fluctuate by much. All right. So just by way of Introduction. Let me. So this will be a little bit mechanically difficult because that screen is very far away from here. Um, but so this is Piazza. Okay, you just go sign in. You use the Q and A and ask questions. Like I said, you can ask an anonymous question. Okay, where the only people who will see that you ask the question is us. Okay, the instructors. Um, and this is for if you're afraid it's a stupid question, right? You don't want to look stupid in front of your peers. Totally get that. Um, you know, and so that's why it's there. You can also ask private questions. So if you have something like, I'm going to be sick, is there anything I can do so that I can miss this class or whatever? That is what a private question would be for. If you ask a private question, but I feel like it's something we should share with the club, okay? Um, I will make it public. I won't make anything about you being sick public, but if you ask a question that I think would be good for everybody to see, I may flip it to public. Depending on the nature of the question, I may ask first, um, but I may just make it public. So if you have something you're truly concerned about, um, you know, let me know. Uh, you know, you can post it privately to Piazza. You can say in the Piazza note, please don't make this public. Um, and then I'll happily go and create a new quote or a new question from me with whatever it was that I wanted to make sure was shared. Um, all right, so 
I believe you will just kind of automatically get enrolled here if you did not, or you're not sure, or you didn't get to it yet. Um, in the welcome email that you should have gotten today, uh, remember if you're not registered for the course, you wouldn't have gotten it, uh, but you should have gotten it today. There's a link in there for how you can go kind of add yourself directly. That's true for this, for great stuff. Blackboard is all managed by the magic in the background. I don't even know what made that noise. <laughs> All right, hopefully that will not make more noise. Um, actually, Rohan, can you just check and make sure it sounds still going? Um, okay, so that's uh, Seriously, I know I'm not making this. Okay. Um, The next thing is grade scope. Okay. Um, you can largely ignore this view. This is my view. It is currently wrong. Okay. Um, however, what you'll see here is okay, that's gonna get really annoying. Um, so what you'll see here is uh basically when when things are due, okay. Uh, and this is also how you submit all of your work. Uh the first lab in discussion will be will walk you through doing this. It's pretty straightforward, but um we'll walk you through it so you can see how to do it once um and i don't know that's great so it'll show you the grade once we release or once we grade it and then release it you'll see the grade for any individual assignment here um then lastly we have blackboard which i'm not going to show you because it will show everyone's data uh but this is blackboard the only thing i really use this for as far as all of you are concerned okay is for the grade center, which I don't know where that appears for you as a user. Actually, oh, I can do student view, I forgot. Um, so I can send this to you, but in the grading area, okay, what you should see is a running status of your current grade, okay? And the reason I do it this way is because grades don't, can't do it. Uh, I don't wanna have to distribute a spreadsheet to all of you to do the math, okay? Because it's not only the obvious part of you know, X percent is homework, Y percent is labs, but also when you haven't done a homework yet, it's not a zero, right? So uh, keeping those up to date is kind of a pain. Maybe many of you have done this before, uh, but in here, uh, once we kind of have some grades to show, uh, you'll see a running current grade, okay? Uh, this you should automatically be enabled for. You just go to learn.bu.edu and it should just be there. The kicker is, okay, if you if we make a mistake or something like that and you see an assignment in here it is not real okay do not submit anything to blackboard as an assignment okay we just use it to show you current grade and final grade ultimately that makes sense okay and i think so, so aside from those, those are pretty much the three tools we run the class with. The only other thing is this thing called the SCC, which is the shared computing cluster, which is where you will do your labs and homeworks, but we'll go through that in detail in the discussion section tomorrow. Okay? So don't worry about that yet. Um, has anybody here used a Jupyter Notebook before? Okay, so uh, we use Jupyter Notebooks in this class, uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, but like I said, I'll we'll introduce you all to that tomorrow. All right. Uh, so there is an attendance requirement in this class. Okay. You are expected to miss no more than three, except by special exception. Uh, so please do try to come. It is uh, important that we, you know, both ask questions of the audience, but then you hear people's questions, et cetera, which you don't, it doesn't get captured otherwise. Uh, so I think it's important for this level of class to attend. Um, and then, but we do try to record all of the lectures so that you can use those to review or, you know, if you were unable to go to the class or something like that, um, you can uh, get the recordings. They will be on YouTube on a playlist that you can find on um, Piazza uh, on, you know, just so you can just view it. Um, however, it takes a little while to process them and get them up there. So 
you know, two weeks or so is about how long it takes. Um, they will generally be there about then. Um, let's see. Yeah, and then I don't know if I have it on the next slide, maybe. Yeah, okay, and then discussion lab section, okay? I don't know how it is for other classes. I haven't actually been here all that long, um, but it is required, okay? It is a mandatory component in this class, so you're expected to come to your lab section, um, and please don't come to some other lab section, even if you know where they are, uh, because what we will do early on in the semester is we'll actually assign groups for doing the lab work together and for doing projects together. Um, and the labs do count for credit, okay? So it's important that you come to those discussion sections for that. There will also be a discussion component of the lab, usually. Uh, we will also do like midterm review in the lab and we will do like final review in the lab, okay? Uh, all of those though are in the fancy new building, unlike this class, because we don't have any classrooms big enough for this. All right. Homework. Generally speaking, are released on the Thursday class. There isn't one today, but generally speaking, they're released on Thursdays and then they're due the following Thursday, okay? But before class. However, if you turn it in by midnight on the Tuesday in between, um, you can get extra credit. Uh, if it is late, uh, you will be penalized, I think it's 10% um, by for 24 hours, okay? If it's after 24 hours, it goes to zero. So please do get the homeworks in. Uh, this is, um, the labs also have similar rules. There's just no early completion done. Um, and then, oh yeah, but there are particularly later in the semester, a couple of weird homeworks, okay? There's like, there's a homework that's released on a Tuesday that isn't due till like well after uh, spring break, stuff like that. So uh, just make sure you check the schedule because they're not perfect. But they're, we try to be pretty consistent. It's just the holidays and stuff like that mess it up. All right. Any questions so far? Cool. All right. Uh, this is the book. Uh, the slide will be posted after this class. That's a live link. Uh, it's also in the syllabus. It's also in the welcome email. Uh, you can also Google it, and it comes back pretty fast. Um, and then one of the things I like to point out is these are the attributions. Um, so I don't know if you noticed on the first slide, um, one of the things having worked for an open source software company that's really important to me is to is licensing. Okay, so and I I mentioned this for a couple of reasons. One, this means that these slides are available for use, and what this is is Creative Commons, which is who made this license. Okay, by which means you need to credit me if you want to reuse it. Okay. And then NC means non-commercial, so you can't use it for commercial use, okay? So, but I also say, you know, everything that's not here owned by other parties, it's under their license. For example, that logo over there, I don't own that, I can't license it, it has its own license. Um, but even if it's something that's in the public domain, which I technically wouldn't have to license, so for example, any content, or uh, not any, most content you find on Wikipedia, is uh, in the public domain. So it means you can just reuse it any way you want. Not always, but most of it. But even if I, it is fair use or public, you know, I can just use it, I'd still try to attribute it to whoever uh, created it, right? Because it's really a nasty thing to do to use somebody's stuff and then not, you know, and claim it as your own, right? Because if I didn't do this, it would imply that I created it, right? So why do I mention this in particular? So first of all, I think it's really important uh, to think about licensing, to think about the um, kind of the source of your content and where it comes from and who owns it, okay? And making sure you have rights to use it before you use it. The reason I say this is because under American law, and this isn't always true, but under American law, if there isn't anything by default, it is mine and you cannot use it, okay? So if you find something on the internet, and it has no license, it does not have a declared license, or it doesn't have a declared copyright of some kind, that means they own it, and you cannot use it without explicit permission from them, okay? So this is uh, important, both in kind of the data science world in particular, 
right? So you go find those random data sets on the internet. If there's no license for it, you cannot use it without permission, okay? So I also mentioned that because, you know, BU has a policy around uh, academic integrity. It's particularly important for this class because of the nature of the stuff we're doing, all right? And one that's been coming up a lot lately is ChatGPT, for example, all right? If you use ChatGPT, then you need to make sure that you attribute it, right? Because you didn't do the work this piece of software did, all right? And one of the things that I've been reading about is that uh, they're looking at ways to water market. So it might very well be possible to tell when it's being used going forward. So either keep very current on what they're doing to uh, you know, be detectable or not detectable, or mention your attributions. All right, any questions? Uh, I think ChatGPT is fascinating. Um, all right. So one of the things that we do in this class is uh, I will do kind of live coding regularly, okay? I have a cheat sheet, uh, so it's not that live, okay? But um, as we refer to in the software world, the demo buttons are evil, okay? So as a result, anytime you're trying to do a demo, there's a very good chance something will go terribly wrong. So um, because the demo gods are evil. So, uh, you know, bear with me if it does. But what I will generally distribute is there will be um, a version of the, uh, like the lecture notebook that I'm going to show in a second that is available to you that you can copy over in advance. And then you can follow along during the class. So basically, I have my cheat sheet, and then I have the one I'm going to show in class, and then I have another one that is distributed to all of you. But it is like taking notes. In other words, I'm not going to distribute the cheat sheet at any point. Okay, so in other words, if you want whatever is whatever we do in class, you need to follow along and type it in yourself. Feel free, however, to come to office hours or catch us after class or whatever. Um, if you miss something, right? You didn't type fast enough, or you know whatever, something just didn't follow, or you have a bug, or whatever. That's totally fine. But I will not be distributing the cheat sheet that I use. We also don't distribute the homework answers. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, you know, what you produce is what you have to refer to. Um, once, for example, homeworks are submitted, labs are submitted, all that stuff, lectures are, are done, you know, feel free to share amongst yourselves, okay? But if you haven't done the work, you won't have anything to uh, reference. That make sense? All right, so now, assuming the demo does, Okay, so the screen is very far away. So give me one second. All right, so this is what's called the Jupyter Notebook. So um, when you're doing it, uh, you might have a slightly different interface. Actually, let me hide some stuff, make it a little easier to read. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, this block up here, uh, and it's going to appear in all the homeworks, all the labs, et cetera, until I don't know, the last couple of weeks of the class. You don't need to think about what's in here basically at all. You don't really even need to think about what's in here at that point. Just if you become interested, we can certainly explain it, um, but it's not really that important to you in the class. Um, let me just find my cheat sheet, which of course... All right, so uh, so we just basically have to run this thing, which is referred to, you will hear me say this a lot, um, this block here, this thing is called a cell, okay, like C-E-L-L, -L, for a lot of the same reasons that the stuff in your body is called cells, hey, it's, a, it's a contained unit, okay, so if I say you run this cell, okay, that means you just run it, 
Um, up in the top, you'll see there's like a little arrow uh, pointing to it. Right? That's how you run a single cell, stop, um, restart, and then kind of run all is kind of those in order if you want to use those. Uh, you can also use shift enter, which I will almost always do on keyboard. So you, you'll never, almost never see me go up there and actually hit that button, but it's the same as hitting that little arrow button. So you run that. Um, and then what I'm going to show you is that what's really cool about a Jupyter Notebook is you can do just like simple math. So you can say two plus three. Okay. And you can take another cell and you can say, let's do bigger stuff. Okay. And that's kind of all there is to it, right? You can just type stuff in there. And then, like I said, you can hit that one button or you can hit shift enter and it'll just run that command, whatever that is. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're actually going to go and grab off of the internet a full copy of Huck Finn and then also a full copy of Little Women two very famous books that you may have had to read at some point in school, um, or maybe read on your own. Um, the Little Women movie is actually quite good as well, um, if you've never seen it. But I don't think we're actually going to use this particular again in the class, but we're going to show off what we can do with stuff. So what I did was I went and grabbed that basically a full set of all of the text of the book Huck Finn. Now, does anybody know what the book Huck Finn is? Any bells? Who's heard of Huck Finn? Back there. <laughs> it's a book of women around the South, yes. Do you know what it's by? Mark Twain, uh, the somewhat more famous book, I would say, is Tom Sawyer. Um, and there's a lot of good anecdotes from that story. Um, but Huck Finn is a character who shows up in the Tom Sawyer book and then gets his own book, basically. Um, and so that's what Huck Finn is. Super famous author Mark Twain. Um, some, he has a whole bunch of what are called apocryphal quotes. There's a lot of quotes that are attributed to him that may not have actually been him. So lies, damn lies, and statistics, I think is one of them. Uh, so it's one of my favorites, which is, um, uh, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I ran out of time. Okay. Uh, which takes some thinking, but is a really interesting one. So what I did was I read all of that book into that thing called Huck Finn text. And then I'm going to look at the chapters by splitting it on the term chapter. And so we can now see the whole book in chapter form. Okay, So this is not terribly useful, but it kind of shows that the whole book is here. Okay. And so we can start to manipulate that book by using some of the things that we're going to use in this class, which is, okay, hey, why don't we make that into a table, okay? So when I say a table, does anybody know what I mean by a table? Yeah. With several rows and columns in it. So something with rows and columns in it. Then we can use the spreadsheet, for example. Okay, so rows and columns, all right? We usually use the term table, uh, for whatever reason, but that's what we mean when we say table. So now I've created a table that has rows, one row per chapter, okay, and only one column, okay, which is chapters, it's called, okay. So think about it as if you think about like a spreadsheet, it's just a really ugly spreadsheet of one column with each row being a different chapter from the book. All right, so. Well, what we might want to do is start to look at what, what we might want to figure out about this book, okay? Let's say we've never read the book. Maybe we want to try to figure out who are the main characters in it, okay? And so one of the things we noticed in, you know, when we were looking at the, the text of the book is that there's a character named Tom. And as I already mentioned, Tom Sawyer, another famous book, is a major character in this book, um, kind of, okay? Why do I say kind of here? So if you look at this, what do you think I did? Counted the amount of times the name Tom. Right. So I counted the number of times the name Tom appeared in each chapter. Okay. And so what do I find when I do that? Right. So basically, the middle of the book, he kind of goes away for a while, right? Uh, and then he, he's, so he's kind of prominent at the beginning and prominent at the end, and then pops in a few times, right? 
However, there might be an easier way to see that. Oh, actually, not yet. So there's another character called Jim, okay? Um, and so what can we theorize about Jim versus Tom? Anybody else? Anybody have any ideas? All right, I need something new. All right, here. Jim is more prevalent in the book. Jim is more prevalent in, in the book than Tom was. So even though Tom has his own prior book, right? Jim seems to be a more common character in this one. Okay, it has a lot more lines. Okay. So what I can do is let's actually make a new table with just all of the counts, but this time we're going to do Tom, Jim, and Huck. Okay, name of the book is Huck Finn, right? So there should be a lot of Huck, right? And it's a reminder that I don't execute those. But so one of the things I can start to do is that prior question I just had, right? You had to compare the arrays of numbers, right? So that's kind of annoying. Might be easier if we could actually show a picture, right? So instead, what I can do is I can make a graph, okay? And I can actually plot them on the graph based on the number of times they appear in each chapter, right? So we have chapter along with all the x axis down here, okay? And then on the y axis is the number of times that name here. So does anybody notice anything interesting here for a book called Huffman? Okay, so why do you think Huck is not mentioned in the book that much? Right? Because it's very well, right? Any ideas why? Is it written in the first person? Because it's written in the first person. Okay. So he he, unlike Perot, who none of you will get that joke, but uh will doesn't refer to himself that much, right? He just talks. And because it's written in the first person, you know it's Huck, but it never says Huck, right? So all of those counts that you do see are someone explicitly mentioning that character. Does that make sense? So kind of tells you a little bit about the book, right? To start to be able to analyze the number of times each of these characters is mentioned. Um, and you can start to try to understand something about the book so that you don't actually have to read it, right? But it is a good book, so I strongly recommend reading it if you like. All right. So let's take a look at Little Women. So basically, we did the same thing. Okay, Little Women is a book about uh, basically a bunch of sisters. Okay, uh, and, and then growing up. Um, and so what we can do though is we can basically do exactly the same thing. And what's nice about this is you can imagine I could actually apply this to kind of any book, right? I can do exactly the same process. I need different names, but maybe even if I got more sophisticated, I could go write some piece of code that would actually find me the names first, right? Or I could take another list of all names that we're aware of and maybe try counts for all of them and then just discover who the book is about, okay? So in this case, we happen to know the main characters are Amy, Beth, Joe, Lori, and Meg. Does anybody know uh, what I should point out about one of these names? Has anybody read this book? Lori is not one of the sisters. Lori is not one of the sisters and is also, yeah, but also a guy, right? Uh, so Lori, much more commonly these days, is a woman's name. And these days when this book was written, it was very commonly a man's name. Even more, I think even more commonly than a woman's name. So Lori in this case is uh, a guy. Um, and uh, so, and that's kind of important in a minute, uh, which, you know, you, you gave a little bit away, but we'll talk about it. So that's the problem with asking questions. All right, so uh, what do we see here, okay? And I can tell you that this book is written in the third person, okay? So in other words, there's not a lot of online in this book. Uh, instead, who is the main character in this book? Is louder, just yell it out. Joe, Joe, Joe. Joe? all right, here. Um, yeah, so I apologize in advance. Uh, the colors that come up are automatic and sometimes they can be a little washed out. I did press the lecture button up here, so it'd be a little bit better. So there's not too many lights on the screen itself, but if you always saw the color, I apologize. Mm -hmm. But once they short, Joe is blue, which is that tall line up there. All right, um, so one of the things that 
Let me see. Let's look at my cheat sheet real quick. Yeah, so uh, there's also something else interesting here. Um, and now I'm going to make you answer it. Um, but do you notice anything special about any of these characters, right? So, um, so Joe is clearly the, the main character, right? But these characters kind of bump along together, right? Mostly. But then something weird happens. Does anybody notice what might happen that's kind of weird there? <laughs> Sorry, so I could hear. It gets well. The names, the names go off over time. Oh, they get closer and closer. Like they, they, they get closer in amount of time to dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's there's two characters in particular that get mentioned. And get closer. I mean the the green. I can't tell what color is that purple or how. This uh, this yeah. one is Amy. Whatever that. Yeah. This the, is Lori. They're pretty much the, the same shape. Right. And why is that theoretically? Because they're not Yeah. Because basically, somewhere around here, okay, they're they're not together too much. Then they come back together, and the reason is is because they get together in a relationship. Okay, so we can start to notice patterns like that. This is a little bit, you know, of a stretch, but um, you know, that's kind of the idea. So as you can see, you can kind of sell a lot of cool things about it. Um, but we can do other kinds of analysis about the book itself. For example, we can look at. The difficulty to read these books. Okay, so one of the one of the uh, like hallmarks of a book that's easy versus hard to read is uh, the length of the sentences. Okay, so one of the things that we can see here is that if we look at Puck Finn, it has a chapter length. So this is a number of characters. So it has seven thousand characters in the first chapter ish, and then sixty six of those characters are periods. So from that, we know there's approximately 66 sentences in that chapter, okay? Um, and so we could, from that, we could say a couple of things. One, how long are the chapters? So one of the hallmarks is like the length of chapters. If they're shorter, it tends to be an easier book to read. And shorter sentences tend to be easier to read. Um, unless you're reading Kant, which is a whole different story. But the long story short, we can start to get a sense of what this book feels like to read, or somewhat more interestingly, we can actually compare it to a different book, which is Little Women, and we can see they're they're vastly different, right? So this has much bigger chapters and many more sentences per chapter. So that maybe tells us this might be a little bit harder to read, okay, than Huck Finn. Probably. Okay. So if did anybody here have to read both of these books in school? All right, so Little Women is usually assigned later in your, in your school career than Huck Finn's, if, it, if they're both assigned. And the reason is because Little Women is a bit harder to read. Okay. So, but the long story short is, you know, whether we're right or not about like kind of some of the things we're discovering about these books, um, the point being is that you can actually get, you can start to extract a lot of really useful information about these books and about uh, you know characteristics like who uh, and who uh, you know and how difficult it is to read and things like that by using relatively similar techniques. Um, so, for example, right, I mean, sure, most of you probably don't know how to read this yet, but in, in the long run, that is not very long, right? There's not that much text to that code that gave us those results. All right, let's see what else we got. All right, and then the last thing we can do is we can actually visualize that. So the prior graph we looked at, and one of the things that's really important in this class um, is to know what graphs to use when for different things, okay? So the prior graph we used is what's referred to as a line graph. Why is that? Because they make lines, right? Okay. Uh, also, we'll just be referred to as a plot sometimes. Um, 
But this one is what's called scat. Okay. And why? Because we have dots scattered all over the place. Right. So, but what we can do here is we can say, hey, we can actually directly compare the two books by putting them on the same graph. And then we can see, and I don't know how well you can tell the colors, but the yellow dots are probably Huxley, but let me go check. Well, oh, I was backwards. So the yellow and gold dots are uh, real women, and the blue dots are hot thing. And so it gives you an idea of uh, about these two books. So we know here's the number of characters, and then the number of periods in the chapter. So it's like how many sentences are packed into each chapter. Right? It gives us a, a sense of them, and we can compare them to each other. So this is really useful when you want to start to analyze arbitrary sets of data. So one of the things I've been struggling with is like, there is a public data set, for example, on um, TikTok uh, video consumption, okay, with a bunch of different characteristics. And I really wanted to like have all of you figure out what makes a video viral um, because I think it's really entertaining, uh, but probably also not predictable, right? So, but if we can actually put them on graphs like this, then we can start to think about what is what's going on here, right? We can compare, say, for example, I think like one of them is uh, danceability was one of the columns on the TikTok data, another one is um, uh, like uh, something like spoken, right? Like whether there's a lot of speaking in it or not, something like that. Um, you know, do those two things correlate and do they make it more likely to be popular? Who knows, right? But these are the things that we can start to figure out when we start playing around with this data and we can visualize it, which often, so we ever heard of the term, right? A uh, picture speaks a thousand words um, because it's sometimes much easier for us as humans to quickly detect the differences between these things if we see a picture, which is funny because when we're doing this with a computer, the computer actually can't read the pictures at all, usually. It only can look at the data. So if you want to think about it, you kind of will visualize things for human consumption, but you will actually keep it as the arrays we talked about earlier on, which were just the sets of numbers uh, when we're talking about it with the computer, right? Uh, any questions? All right. So pretty good timing today. Um, thank you everybody for coming and uh, we will see you on 